Welcome to Renolda Church. We are so glad that you're here. Take just a moment to fill out the Connect card you received when you arrived. Let us know you're here and let us know how we can pray for you this week. We believe in the power of working together and praying together. And the Connect card is a great way to help us stay in touch across all of our campuses. Mark your calendars for June 4th. Student Ministries is hosting a lawn party at the Village Campus. We'll be having a rummage sale, food trucks, live music, arts and crafts for sale, baked goods, and more right here on the front lawn of the Village Campus on June 4th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. You do not want to miss this. All proceeds will go to help students raise money for their summer trips. This is a great cause and an investment in the future of our kids and church. Learn more using the link below. If you want to stay in the know and have all this information drop right into your inbox, go to the link below and sign up for our digital newsletter we call The Days Ahead. Again, we are so glad you're here and welcome to Renolda Church. Pastor Chris here, so excited to share with you the story of one of the local partnerships that we've created through Renota Church. If you don't recognize this wonderful lady standing Hi. next to me, you need to know her. This is Mrs. Johnson. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Well, tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Yeah, I'm Marquita Johnson, proud principal of Mineral Springs Elementary School. Go Bulldogs! I am going into my third year here at Mineral Springs, and it has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I know that I am in the right place. Um, I feel it in my heart. I'm just excited to be here and of course to partner with Renolda Church. What has the partnership with Renolda Church meant for you in the school? It has been so much to our students um, by providing instructional materials to them, supplies for families. It's been so much to our teachers um, by making them feel warm and welcome. Um, as you know, the, the profession um, sometimes feels unappreciated, um, but just the little gifts in the box and the words of encouragement mean so much to our staff and our whole school community. Community. A few years ago, um, we had uh, just an idea from the Lord that is there a way that Renolda Church and my school, uh, Mineral Springs Elementary, could be in partnership together and, and we began to dream and um, it's been one of the most beautiful um, friendships that we've had over the last several years. We appreciate so much all that Renolda does for us. We don't have a, a formal PTA here at the moment. And so, Renolda, you're our PTA. And so all those little gifts that you make for us and put in our boxes and the special lunches that you do for us, um, we just, we love it so much. And it's such a great encouragement for us. So, Renolda Church, we love you. Thank you. Mineral Springs loves you. Um, and we, uh, we look forward to a continued partnership. Sí, mi nombre es Fanny Blanco. Eh, mi posición aquí en la escuela Mineral Spring Elementary es como asistente bilingüe. Eh, yo asisto a la, escuela, a la iglesia Reynolda en español, en donde he estado allí prácticamente como alrededor de un año. Aquí en, es, en la escuela estoy trabajando alrededor de un año también, que el cual este por Lucy, fue la que eh, insistió en que yo viniera a trabajar aquí, me hablaba de la maravillosa que es la escuela y por lo tanto por eso este, terminé aquí. Yo eh, me retiré del sistema escolar por seis meses, que estaba realmente decepcionada de trabajar en la escuela, pero Lucy me insistía de que tenía que estar aquí y por lo tanto este, acepté su propuesta, eh, negándome muchas veces, pero ha sido la mejor decisión porque me encanta trabajar aquí. Eh, la directora es una excelente persona porque me, me permite ser quien yo soy, no tengo que esconderme, no tengo que fingir, no tengo que pretender. Ella sabe quién es Fanny y ella sabe cuando Fanny tiene buenos días y cuando Fanny tiene malos días. The partnership between uh, Mineral Springs and Reynolda Church have been amazing. We ne nobody have been done anything like that before and we are so happy to have you guys here. Uh, teachers are feeling happy 
they feel like appreciated and stuff as well because they don't just do things for our teachers they also do things for our students and staff and we are so happy about all the wonderful things that are happening here between our school and Reynolda. It is hard to explain everything because it has been amazing things and then you get so emotional that you can't explain all the wonderful things you know when you see miracles miracles happening you can't deny you can deny God's presence. You can't deny that He's there and that He's guiding us. How do you express those things? Because sometimes you don't have enough words to say thank you to God, you know? So, and that's amazing. When you see those kind of things happening in your life, you can't deny that He's here. Well, first word of welcome everybody that's joining us online, especially if you're uh, first time checking us out. Uh, really, really glad to be sharing the gospel uh, with you. And to uh, uh, all of us, I want to ask the question. I always like to get a loud response to, are you ready for some good news? Yes. In Christ, you don't only live once, you live forever. And if you really, really know it, it changes everything. We're in a series that I've called Story Wars because I really think that the spiritual battle is a battle for ultimate truth. And it's a, it's, it's a battle for the whole narrative, for the whole way that we understand what life is all about, what our existence is about, what the history of the world's about, what the future of the world's about. What is the real story? And so we've been identifying the stories that clash with the gospel story. And uh, today we want to talk about uh, the, the story of the, of, the, of the culture that is so often essentially wrapped up in the acronym YOLO, you only live once, versus the idea of the gospel which is that you live forever. And we're going to look at a lot of texts, but we're going to start right here in Revelation chapter 21 to see the vision that John had of a new heaven, a new earth. Revelation 21 verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Not just heaven, but a new heaven and earth. 
There was a man who uh, died, arrived at the pearly gates, met St. Peter, and uh, St. Peter said, come on in. The man said, well, wait a minute, can I bring some of my stuff from earth? And St. Peter said, no, no, Uh, hadn't you ever heard it said you can't take it with you? That's true, you can't bring stuff into heaven. The man said, well, can I please just bring some of my stuff? And Peter said, no, you can't. He kept begging Peter until finally he said, okay, you go back, you can bring one bag of your stuff, and you can bring it into heaven. So the man arrives back at the pearly gate. He's got a big bag that he has stuffed full of solid gold bricks cashed in his assets, put it all into gold, put it into a big bag, and he's heaving that thing into the pearly gates. St. Peter said, come on in. And the man said, thank you. Peter said, could I take a peek inside of your bag? And the man said, sure. Peter looks in, opens up, and lifts up his head and said, you brought pavement? I'm sure when we get to heaven, the values uh, and the things that are valuable and how we view everything is going to be real, real different. But what I want to, what I want to talk to you about today is a biblical view of what it means to live forever that is probably different than the way you have envisioned it. And I want to talk to you about why it is so vital that we live with the consciousness that we will live and flourish together as Christians in a new heaven, a new earth. Because when you think about that and you look at the perspective of your life from that perspective, posture of, hey, I'm going to live forever, it will change everything about how you live. I heard a pastor preach a sermon many years ago that stuck with me. He was quoting the famous song and said, imagine there's no heaven. And he started this whole message and went through the whole time, kept saying, imagine there's no heaven, what would it be like? He said, well, if you imagine there's no heaven and people didn't believe in heaven, what would it be like? Well, they'd probably worship youth and everybody would do all they could to try to stay as young looking as they could. Old people might get put to the side if you imagine there was no heaven. And probably people would be very materialistic trying to get as much as they could while they could since there was no heaven. And people would be worried a lot and have a lot of, he kept going through this. And of course, you realize, you know, halfway through, he was just describing so much of the essence of American culture. That in reality, we live as though there is no heaven. And uh, when people say YOLO, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's mostly, you know, I'm not very up on the hashtag stuff, but I guess it's mostly like used to speak of people that do foolish things because, hey, you only live once. You know, like um, somebody posts, hey, I uh, jumped off the balcony at my hotel down into the pool and I broke my leg, but hey, YOLO. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like an excuse for doing stupid things or something like that. But I bring this up because the idea that you only live once um, is a mentality that ends up shaping how people are thinking about their life and I want to contrast that with the the biblical the biblical view and I think that you're going to see some things about what the Bible speaks of eternity that's probably different than you've seen before and it is so encouraging um, and freeing when you really think about it all. Well, the problem of uh, thinking that you only live once and that you're, you know, this is all there is, it can have um, such uh, equal and opposite harmful effects for us, probably affects everybody differently. For, for some people, it means well, this is all that there is, 
So I, I might live rec recklessly after all, there's not that much at stake, or it might mean that I just, I don't, I'm, don't, I give up on trying at anything. I'll just try, you know, it's kind of the eat, drink, and be merry. Just get what you can, do what you can, have as much pleasure as you can because you only live once. But, but there's another side to it, and, and it might be a, a lot of us, you know, that might think more like this. It's certainly more what my temptation would be, and that is to have the idea that since you only live once, that you've got to make sure that you cram in everything that you need to get accomplished because this is your only shot at it. And, I, you know, if you're a little bit more like I am where, you know, I want to do well. I want to make an impact. I want to make a difference. I want to, I want to, I want to apply myself. I don't want to waste my life. That I think that the idea of, of acting as if, thinking as if this world is all there is, leaves me um, too often driven and it makes us perfectionistic, and it makes us, um, so it can have, it can have a, a, a result in either the direction of, hey, just eat, drink, be merry, just don't worry about anything, or it can make you worry too much about everything, if this is all there is. And it creates at least three huge problems in our souls. And people do, anything in our culture to not think about their mortality mainly because it's too scary to think about unless you have an assurance of heaven and people people can look as though they're experiencing this world in a similar way even though what they're actually feeling deep on the inside is vastly different pastor john piper said it was like Imagine two people who have jumped out of an airplane and both of them could look like they are enjoying the exhilarating feeling of skydiving. But imagine only one of them has a parachute. <laughs> they both look really free, you know, but only one of them is actually free because the other the entire skydiving experience is ruined by what is coming at the end of it. It's a very fearful thing to think that you only live once, to think that this is what it is. And I think something else that happens in the soul when we, we're not aware of heaven is we are loaded up with regret I was talking to someone recently who was uh, sharing about the death of a loved one and just said, you know, her struggle towards the final days was constantly thinking back over all the things that she wished she'd done differently. That's what regret feels like. And if you, if you don't carry a consciousness of you're going to live forever, then once you've blown it, you know, you feel this sense of like, I can't get that back. I can't do it again. And, and so you live with this gnawing feeling of regret. It's a terrible feeling. And the other, of course, thing that happens when you think you only live once is, is just hopelessness. I'll have more to say about this. But hope is what energizes us to keep living. It's, it's when you think there's no point to it, that's when you give up, right? It's, it's, it's when the athlete on the field feels like the game's over and the lead is insurmountable, they'll never be able to win. That's when you quit trying. It's when you think you have no chance of passing the exam that you just quit studying. We get hopeless when we think that there's no point point to it all and then it's just going to end anyway so anxiety regret and hopelessness are what happens to the soul that has no real assurance of living forever yolo it really is a way to say i'm gonna be anxious and maybe i'll mask it by being reckless maybe i'll mask it by being super achieving 
but it really is an anxious life. And when things don't go well, it's hard to do anything with it except just have regret, and ultimately it feels hopeless. It's not just that we as Christians need to think much and delight in the assurance of heaven, but it's really important that we understand the biblical view of what eternity is going to look like because we've got some wrong ideas about heaven. Mark Twain's famous rambunctious character, Huck Finn, was not attracted to Miss Watson's instructions about heaven, and Huck said to her, and Huck uh, said, she went on and told me about all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it. And I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and she said not by a considerable sight. And I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. There's no such thing as a, as a, a middle school boy that gets excited about a vision of heaven that's floating around in clouds with a harp. And it hasn't really helped that almost all of the images that we get of heaven are like this. I was trying to think back of some of the, you know, the old movies about, you know, that would depict heaven. It's a Wonderful Life starts out, and it just kind of has these, like, starry situations, you know, and voices that are speaking from heaven. I guess that's kind of acceptable. Does anybody remember the old movie of Warren Beatty called Heaven Can Wait? That, that I, 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 this came to mind, this old movie, and, and, uh, and it depicts it as he, has, uh, he goes back and, and does somebody else's body as an athlete. But the heaven scene is like this escalator and this, and this cloudy you know, scene. And Bruce Almighty, remember Bruce Almighty, when he meets God, it's, it's like in a building. But again, even there, it's like everything has to be white and everything is kind of sterile. You know, you know what you, in all the movies and all the books and all the image, you know what you never see an image of heaven being? You never see the image being um, people playing football and having cookouts and uh, having big uh, festivals and uh, artists that are creating beautiful things and uh, musicians that are playing new songs and, and, uh, and people that are in civilizations enjoying one another in big cities. It's like you never see that. And, and, yet, and yet if you really study the Bible, what you realize the image of, of a, the new heaven and new earth is, well, more earthy. It's not clouds and floating around. The, the biblical view of, of eternity is not an ethereal heaven, but is a vision of a glorification of this self-same earth that is joined together with heaven in a whole new way. It is like, it is similar to, analogous to the way the Bible teaches about the resurrection of the body. Now, it is absolutely true that when you die as a Christian, you immediately go into the presence of the Lord into glory because Jesus said to a thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. But it is equally true and profoundly important to understand that the biblical view is that these self-same bodies that turn to dust or ashes are resurrected in a resurrection miracle by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and in the same manner he was the first fruits he actually died as a human being and he was resurrected in a spiritual body that was still him totally Jesus right but his body's different and in the same way you get a new you get a new body so it's really you 1 Corinthians, Paul teaches this way about it. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised and what kind of body they come? And what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he's chosen, and each kind of seed its own body. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly of another. 
So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. So if there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Sometimes as I'm going to the graveside for a graveside committal service, um, especially if I know there's some children and grandchildren that are going to be there around the grave, I'll, I'll sometimes look and see if I can't find an acorn and just pick it up and show that little acorn to describe what Paul's talking about and say this acorn actually becomes a big oak tree and maybe point to some big oak tree in the cemetery. If I had a bet, even better image, I'd like to get the seeds for the giant sequoia and how tiny they are, comes from a, like, what looks like a pine cone and then get in your mind the giant sequoia and the redwoods that are so huge and tower uh, to such amazing uh, heights. That, what Paul's saying is that if you want to understand an analogy to help you understand what the resurrection of the, of the body is like, it's like a seed, like an acorn goes in the ground and it becomes an oak tree. That acorn is the substance of that oak tree, but it is so glorified, it is so transformed that when you see the tree, you go, well, that's no comparison to the acorn. But it is from the acorn, totally. So the miracle of resurrection means that when you die, your body, which decays, becomes dust, like the dust from which God made Adam in the first place, that God, at the consummation of all things, resurrects your body, and you are, you are going to live forever as your same person you are now in your same body, but glorified. And it may be as much more glorified as a giant sequoia is than the seed from which it came. Now, the reason I bring this up is I'm trying to help you understand something about new heaven and new earth. Because what you see in the Bible with God is when he makes something good, he wants it to continue. So he doesn't throw your body away. You're too much of a masterpiece, and God's too sovereign to let anything, including sin or death, eventually claim you. He doesn't annihilate you. You continue. And so everything I have to say that's encouraging and powerful about understanding what it means to live forever is built upon this principle. God continues good works to its completion. And the other thing that this image of the resurrection of the body shows is glorification. God takes through a process that which is of more humble glory and makes it more glorious. So things continue with God and God glorifies those things. Now, that helps me understand what we're going to get with a new heaven and a new earth. Remember, the earth itself is not what we talk of in the Bible when we talk about don't love the things of the world. That's talking about the systems of the world, the sin of the world, the broken things of the world. But the earth itself, this creation, is spectacular. Genesis 1.10, God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and God saw it was good. Genesis 1.12, the earth brought vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, trees bearing fruit in which are seed each according to its kind. And God saw that it was, say it with me, good. Genesis 1.17, God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day, over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that, say it, it was good. Genesis 125, God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and say it with me, and God saw it was good. Genesis 131, God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was, and this time he said, very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So here's how God feels about what he made. It's really good. And, and the picture of Eden itself is spectacular. Genesis 2, 8, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. 
And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. Every tree. And the tree of life's in the midst of that garden. So, what does God do with good things? They continue. And he glorifies them. When they are broken, he fixes it. When they are seemingly beyond repair, he restores. He continues and he glorifies. And what we see is a good and beautiful creation, an earth that God is no more going to throw away than he's going to throw away you. Why would we think he's going to throw this away? And no more than he would throw us away just because we had fallen into sin. He's not going to throw this away. It's prophesied. For example, Isaiah 65, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And then in the New Testament, I could just read so many scriptures to prove this to you, but this is what Paul's talking about in Romans 8, where he says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because of, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. See, the creation itself, this earth, will be set free. It's not going to be thrown away. And obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Glorification. We know, verse 22, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Yeah, it feels like it's groaning. It feels like the earth is groaning because too many things are broken. Not only in creation, but verse 23, but also ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit proving to us that we're children of God, bearing witness to us that we're going to live forever. And yet we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we're saved. This is hope. Now hope that seems not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. He's talking about hope rather than hopelessness because you live forever and the earth goes on forever. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, he talks very specifically about these things. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, I'm talking about something that is, whether this is literal or not, this is analogous to your own body turning to dust. Somehow this all turns to dust, perhaps. I don't know. But all these things, verse 11, are dissolved. And he's talking about waiting and anticipating, verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. The heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But, a, but this is what happens in all of that about, okay, somehow this all is becoming dust so that it'll be remade. But look what he says in verse 13, but according to its promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, with God, he makes this fantastic, spectacular creation and says, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's very good. And gives us assurance after assurance after assurance that he who began a good work carries it to its completion. He does not throw away his good work. That would be letting the devil win. But instead, his good work continues and he glorifies what he's made into something that's even better than what you could have ever imagined. So what it means, beloved, is that we as Christians are not going to just depart and go to some cloudy, ethereal, heavenly place, but we immediately go into the presence of God, and now we're outside of time. Now here's a mystery I don't know how to explain to you, but I think when you're outside of time, which we can't understand because we're fish in water, we're in time, we, we don't know what that'd be like. But you're outside of time, where you're departed 
to be with the Lord. So in a sense, I don't think you're having to wait for the resurrection because you're in eternity. I don't know how that works, but Christ comes again. The dead are raised. We are all given spiritual bodies, but it's really us, and we are not living in some place that is completely unfamiliar, but instead the earth itself, having been joined together with heaven, is made new but is still earth. Wow! I mean, it changes everything. If you start looking at your life like that. I think the, I think the places that you love uh, being are going to be, be part of the new heaven and new earth. You got a favorite beach? It's going to be there. Why wouldn't it be there? You got, you got, you got favorite places you'd still like to see, and you didn't make your trip around the world yet. You're going to just get you get to see. You got you got eternity to explore. If it's a new earth. It means that culture continues, but glorified. Good music, good art, good food. When you read about the new heaven and new earth in the Bible, it's, it's more earthy than we make it to be. It's beautiful. Cultures and civilizations and friendships and delights and joys and learning and growing and wow what this means for us is momentous in every way because in the first place it's the answer to our angst and God wants you Christians he wants you to be a hundred percent assured that you're going to live forever with him This is very important because there are some well-meaning teachers and preachers that have, in a sense, dangled the assurance of heaven in front of people to try to motivate them to live a holier or better life. But that is not the view of the Bible. You could sum up God's heart from 1 John 4, verse 16. We've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Confidence, 100% assurance that you don't have to have any fear of meeting God because as he is so are we what does this mean it means that as holy as Jesus is by his own merits that you as a Christian have been given reckoned with the righteousness of Jesus himself so that in God's eyes you are no longer in his view tainted by sin but are fully as righteous as the Son of God himself. As he is, so we also are in this world. So have no fear of retribution. Have no fear of dying and being punished. Christian, live with no fear. And what it changes for us, in addition to lifting our angst, is that When you think about living in a new heaven and a new earth in your self-same body as your self-same person and personality but glorified, this to me explains the rewards that we have in heaven. I don't have time to go to the scriptures about this, but as a preacher of grace who loves grace, Some of the texts that people bring to me and sometimes stumble over and are challenging are those texts that speak of different rewards for those 
who have done good works in the earth. That's a little confusing when we know the whole message of the gospel is that you're not rewarding according to your own merit. So how do you, how do you possibly have different rewards based on how you've lived in this world? Well, this, this is the closest to understanding it that I've come. It is that you and I, I'm, as Christians, we live forever in a new heaven and a new earth and our actual lives continue so what this means is that you don't run out of time and so you never say well I might as well give up trying because I'm just not going to be able to get that done or learn that or correct that or be But instead, you say it all continues, and so every day, I'm making a continued investment. So uh, it's like I've mentioned to you that I've taken up guitar again. I played as a kid for a number of years, and in college, uh, and then I, I took up piano, and I gave my guitar to my son. I hadn't touched a guitar in forever. So picking up the guitar and learning, learning it again, I wasn't starting from scratch by no means. In fact, in about a year's time, I think I'm further maybe than I was back when I was playing, when I was playing that much. Why? Because it continued. What I had started of years of playing the guitar, which was a delight, not a duty, but a delight, but still work, Anything you do that you're having to learn, it's work, but it was a delight. And I picked it back up, and, and it, it wasn't like it had all been annihilated from, because I'd left it alone for a while. I just picked it back up. So in that sense, I, I am being rewarded for the guitar playing that I did many years ago. And now I'm enjoying it. Someone else who had not been playing the guitar years ago and started now would be starting from scratch. What if, because you live forever in a new heaven and a new earth, the real story is that everything that you're doing now is part of you. And so it continues. And I like to write and I want to be productive. And I've written five books and it doesn't feel like anything to me. I should have written 20 by now. That's the way I feel. But I feel energized when I think about, I'm going to keep on writing in a new heaven and a new earth. Be a little different, won't be any sinners to be writing to, you know, but I'd be, it'd be, but I'll be, I think I can still learn about Jesus and share some things, you see. I'm, I'm just saying, you, yourself, you continue. So on your dying day, I think you ought to be learning something new because you're going to probably carry that as part of your soul into eternity. Wow. It also, a, a view of living forever, delights our souls with hopeful expectancy. Back to this matter of hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. It's not... A little girl saying, I hope I get a pony for Christmas, when there's no chance she's getting a pony for Christmas. Hope is instead the delight of the soul, a bliss that arises from the assurance of a blessed future. Hope knows that there's a blessing that's coming. So hope is more like if that little girl was excited in the middle of December and you say why are you excited and she says because silly Christmas is coming and you said to her well why is it exciting and makes you happy that Christmas is coming and she said because silly we get presents and you said to her well do you have those presents now those toys are they yours now she said no they'll be under the tree well why are you so happy now because, silly, Christmas is coming. That's hope. 
I'm going to have presents under the tree. I know they're going to be good. I don't know everything about it, but it really makes me happy right now, even though I don't actually have any of it right now. That is exactly, exactly the way God wants us to live in this world. I'm living forever, and it's going to just get better and more glorious. And I would say this finally, that what it does for us also to think of what it means to live forever, it empowers you to endure difficulties, to make sacrifices, to bear up under challenges with seemingly effortless power because of the grace that is yours It's very much like my son Bennett and his wife Amy that are expecting their first child in October. And we went to see them on Monday because they bought a house. It's not a very good time to buy a house. It's a seller's market. But they lived in a one-bedroom apartment in uptown Charlotte, and they didn't have room for a baby in that apartment, they've bought a house. They spent more than they probably like to have spent, but the baby's coming, you gotta, you gotta spend it. And I went to go and uh, celebrate, let's see your new house, as we pulled up, see it for the first time, and uh, he was standing there, my son, with a little look of frustration, got out, said, what's going on? He said, the garage door won't open. And unfortunately, I'm not technical enough to help him figure it out. We sat there for about a half hour trying to figure it out, Googling things, and it wouldn't work. And I said, welcome to homeownership. And they only had one car, so they need another car. And um, you start changing everything about the priorities of your life because this baby's coming. And you don't even think of it, as a, of, a, of it as a sacrifice because the baby's coming. Because of the extraordinary hope and gift of this life that's coming into the world. You bear up under challenges that you've never experienced. And you endure garage doors that don't open and you spend more on things than you thought you would and it changes everything but that's what hope does and that's what biblical hope does for those that suffer and are persecuted in this world YOLO you only live once well if it's true then Either you better cram in and sacrifice everything, be driven, accomplish all you can, sacrifice relationships, never relax, never uh, take delight in beauty or rest or Sabbath, just cram life in there. Or, or on the other hand, if it's YOLO, then just do reckless things. Who cares? It's all going to be over soon anyway, or eat, drink, and be merry, accumulate what you can, because it just doesn't, you know, just get what you can out of this life, because I was like, if that's what YOLO is, that's the way life will feel. But if you live forever in a new heaven, in a new earth, all that fear is dissolved. All that hopelessness is answered. And passion arises within you to get up every day and keep living because the best is yet to come. Everything God does is good, and therefore he wants it to continue and to be glorified. And when you're in Christ, that's what you're guaranteed, and that's the gospel.
riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world children, we only grow in our understanding and experience of that love, and we have forever to do so. So we give you praise and honor and glory. So we get to heaven, we're not going to be floating around on some clouds and playing harps. And, and, and not, only, not only is that silly, but it's going to be our self-same bodies in a new heaven, a new earth, that, okay, your body's glorified. It'll be, you know, we'll be like seeing each other going, man, good to see you. You're looking good. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to not only recognize one another, but we're going to enjoy being together with one another because um, all of it continues, right? And, and, and something that you're, you're learning now and you'll keep learning, then in a new heaven and a new earth, you keep learning it. It's 
magnificent. I'll be seeing Matt and finding out, hey, listen, listen, Alan, listen to this new song I put together. What do you think of this? What do you think Jesus is going to think of this? I think he's going to like that one. I'm going to be seeing Nate bumping into him. Hey, you got a new record out, man. You've done something else with some hymns. What are you doing this? I've been taking up tennis again, and I told my wife I wouldn't get hurt, and the third time I went out, I pulled something on my calf. Won't have that problem in the new heaven and the new earth. Play as much tennis as you want. It's... It is to say that everything about how you live now changes in light of knowing that you will live forever. If we don't have that, if we don't have it, we have hopelessness. And if you want to understand why hopelessness and anxiety are epidemic in our culture today, especially in the younger generation, this explains it. YOLO. You only live once, so what's the point of it? And the gospel says something entirely different. Let your heart be continually filled with the hope of heaven. And may the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.